to uh, Building Bridges. Uh, we are a grassroots organization that was formed um, in 2020 during Mayor Pete's uh, run for uh, president. And um, our mission is we are guided by the principles of servant leadership. And we basically are um, trying to do relational grassroots organizing and equipped to build support campaigns and causes based in progressive values. Our values are based on Mayor Pete's rules of the road, which are respect, belonging, truth, teamwork, boldness, responsibility, substance, discipline, excellence, and joy. We try to uh, do everything through our organization through these four lenses, which are encouraging belonging, bridging the rural and urban divide, racial equity, and democratic reform. Every Tuesdays and Thursdays, our uh, trainers will uh, have free workshops available online, which are everything from conversations that break through, civics 101, um, and basically how to um, help people around you, encourage them to participate in having hard conversations and volunteering with you. We also have our, uh, I think we have 35 endorsed candidates currently right now, like Danielle, and we do everything from like the Sunday night town halls to text banking, phone banking. We are really good at writing postcards. Um, and our upcoming event next week, we will have Justin Chinette, who is uh, running for the York County commissioners in Maine and District 3. He has a really interesting story, so I really encourage you to stop back by and check him out. And But tonight's special guest is Danielle Helzer, who is running for the Nebraska State Board of Education. Um, you can follow her at on her social media at Helzer for Education and then her website as well to learn more about her. And now I'm going to stop my screen sharing and I'm going to kick it over to Danielle to introduce herself and why she's running for office. Hey everyone, uh, it's good to see some, some familiar faces and some new faces. Um, my name is Danielle Helzer, I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I um, came to this race um, out of an abundance of concern for public education. Um, I spent the first part of my adult life as a public school teacher. So I taught in rural, suburban, and in urban schools all throughout Nebraska um, for eight and a half years. I taught high school English. Um, so I have really um, had some great experiences in Nebraska teaching in schools of all sizes um, and teaching students of all different backgrounds and all different walks of life and all different faiths and sexualities and all of that. Um, after uh, eight and a half years of teaching in the classroom, uh, my husband, who's also a teacher, uh, we became foster parents and, um, and we got placed with two kiddos in a matter of eight months who were the same age. And so one of us needed to be more available. And I, I volunteered as tribute <laughs> and stepped away from the classroom um, to be able to care for these two, two young people. They were five uh, when they moved in into our home. And um, so I, I've stayed out of teaching. I've been out of teaching for a little while now. Um, and since uh, once we got our kids adopted um, and we ended up providing permanency for them, then I moved into the nonprofit sector. Um, I, I, in, it, in between that though, I worked for community colleges and adjuncted part-time, um, taught uh, English, and was a writing coach for students at the community college level. And then I also did some adjuncting um, for teachers who were working on their master's degrees. Um, so I was at UNL and UNO, um, and I would spend summers uh, working with teachers and helping them to incorporate writing across the curriculum, across the content areas. Uh, and then after that, I moved into the nonprofit sector. The nonprofit sector, as you all know, can be really flexible. Um, and so it's great when you um, are a mom with two busy kids. And I started the nonprofit sector working, working for Big Brothers Big Sisters of Central Nebraska. Um, so I worked a lot with families, one-on-one -on -one with vulnerable families, um, and uh, getting them enrolled in our system, and then working with volunteers, recruiting them, the big, the big benefit of that for me was really thinking about the safety process. Like how do we keep kids safe in one-on-one -on -one mentoring relationships, which it's so interesting because that was my first nonprofit job and it's kind of come full circle um, because now that I'm running for state board of education in Nebraska, I've been called a groomer. <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I tell people all the time, like I actually trained people 
right? Um, how to identify grooming, uh, you know? And so what we're using, you know, the context that we're using the word groomer and now is totally um, wrong and it doesn't fit the definition um, and it's been used as a political weapon. Um, so I have been trained by national trainers on how to recognize grooming and uh, child abuse. Uh, after my time at Big Brothers Big Sisters, then I moved over to YWCA of Grand Island, and um, I started that job right before COVID hit, and um, and so that was a really interesting time. Um, we ended up developing lots of programming for women um, who had suddenly found themselves out of work. They women that worked in retail industry, service industry, um, the hotel restaurant industry women that were out of work and they didn't know when they were going to be able to go back. And so we worked with women virtually um, and helped them to figure out how to build a resume, use the internet sometimes, um, how to navigate Zoom interviews, and then think about like other career paths that they could go into. Um, especially we wanted to be able to upskill women, right? So that they could earn more for their families. Um, once we were able to do some in-person work, then we also provided childcare for these women as they were working with our staff, um, you know, to build their resumes and things like that. Um, and and in, in addition to the work um, of empowering women at YWCA, I also did lots of trainings on racial justice in our community. So we live in central Nebraska, that's where I live. Um, and our community demographics have changed drastically in the last 10 years. Grand Island, um, now our population is about 40% people of color. Um, and that's a totally different Grand Island than 20 years ago. And so our community has had to really learn to adjust to these different demographics. Um, and luckily, like right away, early in 2020, we were able to build some great momentum and trained lots of people. Um, and then we started to see a lot more hostility sort of creep in um, as we've moved closer to the election season and things like that. So um, I feel well equipped, though, you know, to do this hard work of running for office because of the hard work that I've gotten to do in the classroom and the hard work that I've gotten to do in nonprofits and, um, and training people um, on really tough topics like racial justice and how to be more inclusive and how to create more welcoming communities. So, like I mentioned, um, I, I got in this race uh, because I'm really concerned about public education. Uh, Nebraska is a wonderful state for public education. We rank ninth in the nation for the strength of our, of our state's public schools. Um, we are one of, I think, five states in the nation that's been able to hold off on the voucher and charter system. Um, so we do not have, right, like, yes, we do not have vouchers and charters in Nebraska. Um, and so we have public education. We still have private schools in Nebraska. So we still have school choice. So this is what I tell people all the time. We have school choice in Nebraska. Um, parents can choose to send their, their students to a public school. A lot of our public schools are open enrollment schools. And so you can go to any sort of public school. When I taught at Burke High School in Omaha, I had kids coming on a bus from all over the city. We have like 40 buses coming, you know, and dropping kids off from all over the city. Where we live in Grand Island, we sent our kids to a different school than our neighborhood school um, in Grand Island Public because it looked more like, like their experiences, you know, in their early childhood. So Nebraska is really strong for that. Um, Nebraska has strong private schools too. Um, and the private schools, even though they're you know, tuition-based schools and often they're religious-based institutions, a lot of our private schools provide excellent scholarships for families um, who maybe can't afford to send their child there. They still um, oftentimes will provide financial aid so that families can go. And then we also have homeschooling. Um, we are a state that allows parents to to make that choice for their, their family, if that's what's best for them. So we have some really great school choice options. Um, and the one thing that I think is really on, um, that's sort of uh, precarious right now is the introduction of charters and vouchers in Nebraska. Um, that is a priority of um, the far right uh, in our state. Uh, they would like to have more public dollars going into our private institutions. Now, the thing is, is that in Nebraska, we, we fund our schools primarily with property taxes. So we rank 49th in the nation for the amount that our state provides for public education, um, which is very, very dismal. <laughs> um, and, and so we don't, we have great public schools, but we don't get a lot of help from the state for public dollars. Um, 
And I can't imagine what's going to happen to our public schools if we get private or charters and vouchers introduced, then we continue to starve out our public schools, right? And it's the slow defunding movement. So I am making sure, you know, that I talk about this all the time, that I am pro public schools. Um, I'm also pro like the school choice that we have in Nebraska right now. I have one child in a private school in, in Grand Island and I have one child in public school. And so I've got a feat in both worlds. Um, I pay tuition for one child and I don't for the other. And I know it's important for families to have that choice, um, but we can keep that choice without introducing charters and vouchers into our state. Um, a couple of things that are really important to me in terms of issues and things that you know I want to make sure that I'm prioritizing in my campaign is number one, supporting our teachers. Like full stop. Because here's the thing: like when we have good teachers in the classroom, that trickles down to students. And then we support students when we're supporting teachers. And we know that teacher burnout is on the rise. We see that across the country, and Nebraska is not immune to it. We know that students are not going into education. In 2017, um, there was a study done and across the country, teacher enrollment programs were down 38%, okay? Nebraska though, in 2017 was down 48%. So we, uh, we were 10% higher than the national average. Um, that means we need to do something in our state to recruit more folks into education. Um, and a lot of this, you know, when I'm out on the campaign trail and I'm talking to people, you know, we talk a lot about teacher certification. Um, we talk a lot about uh, reciprocity and making sure that teachers from other states who have teaching degrees and who have experience teaching, that they can easily obtain a teaching certificate in Nebraska. And that's not the case right now. So we have to make sure that we're identifying some of these barriers to teacher recruitment um, and making it easier for people to become, not, not watering down the requirements, right, of course, but making it easier for people who have the experience um, to become teachers in Nebraska. Uh, we've also been talking a lot on the campaign trail about thinking, thinking through um, teacher certification for folks that have a four-year content area degree. So if, if you've got someone who has an English degree, helping them to be able to obtain a fast-track teaching certificate um, while they're also, you know, have some experience teaching in the classroom. So those are some things that we need to consider, um, and that's some work that the state board can do in terms of thinking through um, certification. So really identifying what are the barriers for recruitment, and then the other thing that I'm concerned about is what are the barriers for retention? Why are so many of our teachers leaving? Now, the number one thing that I think needs to happen um, in order to address this teacher retention issue is we need to make sure that we're able to have teacher voice on the State Board of Education. Um, lots of states do this. Wyoming is a state, our, one of our neighbor states does this. They have teachers who sit on the State Board of Education, current staff members, and they have vote. They have votes, they have voting power. Um, that allows teachers to be able to have a say in the policy making process. I know when I stepped away from the classroom after teaching for eight and a half years, I was burnt out. I had, um, my last year of teaching, I had 30 students in every class. I had almost 300 students. Um, I was teaching English. I didn't have enough, uh, enough books for every student. I sometimes didn't have enough desks for every student and the benchmarks were always changing. Um, and that is a way that we burn teachers out. And I think the best way to avoid some of that is by having teacher voice on the State Board of Education. So that's gonna take time to implement because that's a big shift uh, from what we have now. But I think we start small by having committees of teachers you know, from all across the state, not just our Lincoln and Omaha, but from our central Nebraska, from our Western Nebraska, north, uh, the Northeastern part of our state, um, having teacher voice in the policy making process is a way that we can start to retain teachers. They want to have a part in the policy making process and we need to give them that, that voice. Um, and then next, the next thing that I talk about a lot is um, making sure that we're supporting our student and staff mental health and well being. Um, a lot of schools have made some really important shifts lately. Um, they are starting to put full time mental health professionals in their schools, not just guidance counselors, full time mental health professionals to supplement with their guidance counselors. I've met with some schools that have done amazing work at also providing these mental health professionals to teachers and staff 
during the school day. So if you have a plan period or you can find someone to cover your class and you need a quick therapy session, because sometimes, you know, in the classroom, we need a quick therapy after we're, you know, had something big happen in a classroom, we need a quick therapy session. Um, and schools have done some really great work with this. And we need to make sure that it stays long after the next two years, um, because we're going to be dealing with the aftermath and the effects of COVID for many, many more years. Um, so making sure that we've got some good partnerships uh, with communities and local districts to ensure that our students and staff mental health and overall well being are cared for. So those are just like a snippet of the three things I could talk for like a like four hours about, <laughs> you know, things that I'd love to see accomplished on the State Board of Education. But I'm going to pause now and I think we're going to move into some questions. Is that right? We are, cool. <laughs> which I'm sure you will be able to elaborate on in the next hey. minutes on some of these things. Okay. Hey. One of the ones that I find fascinating is, um, so I'm going to kick it off, mm -hmm. but how big your district is and how yeah. diverse it is. And so yeah. if you can just, I know you hit on diversity of like where you live, but like your district is huge. Yes. Yes. So, so um, our district was redrawn because of the census um, and it has 17 counties. Um, so it's huge. Uh, the furthest county away from me is about four hours. Um, and so pretty significant drive. Um, it covers some rural demographics, but it also has some urban demographics. Um, the total uh, voting population is 197,462. So that's how many eligible voters we have in District 6, which is huge. Um, and then when we talk about diversity, uh, we have everything from a very rich Latino uh, population to tribal schools. We have a few reservations in, in uh, District 6, um, but like only 60% of the voting population in District 6 identifies white. Um, so it's, a, it's an incredibly diverse district. Um, and a lot of people think central Nebraska, rural Nebraska, not diverse at all. Incredibly diverse folks, um, because we have uh, industry that draws immigrant refugee populations um, and they're settling in some of our rural communities. Uh, and so schools have had to really do a lot of work to shift to be able to provide for, for uh, these changing demographics. Great answer, thank you. Um, Christy. Would you like to read your question or do you want me to read it for you? You can read it. Okay. Uh, Christy is one of our steering committee members too, like Wes, and um, she is in Loudoun County, Virginia. And our, she said, our governor is trying to pass laws diverting our school's funds to private schools. Here in our county, that's $18,000 per child. Why should public taxes subsidize rich people? Uh, yeah, they shouldn't. And that's why, you know, and that's one of the things that I want to fight against. Um, the State Board of Education in Nebraska doesn't have a lot of say on the funding. Um, it's our unicameral. So our state legislature, uh, we're the only unicameral in the nation. It's pretty fun. Yay, yay. We need to keep it nonpartisan. Um, but which is at danger too. We're, we're at risk of losing our unicameral in Nebraska. Um, at any way, our legislature makes those decisions, but one of the things that the State Board of Education can do is build really strong relationships and really strong arguments and reasons why we should not be funneling public dollars into private institutions. Um, number one, um, we know that it starves the most vulnerable children, right, from resources uh, if we start to subsidize the wealthy to send their kids to private school. Um, and um, number two, in Nebraska, a lot of our private schools are religious-based institutions, okay? And so we need to have that separation of church and state, um, and we can't be funneling our public dollars into religious-based institutions, especially the other big part of this is that private schools do not have to accept all students. Public schools are the, one of the only institutions remaining in our country that is open to all people, and it's a beautiful thing, right? It's wonderful. Private schools don't have to accept every student. They don't have to accept an LGBTQ student. They don't have to accept or provide special education services. Um, so in Nebraska, we're gonna fight against that. We've been able to hold off privatization um, for our schools, but it's coming, like the fight is coming and I am, I am poised to be mama bear for our public schools. <laughs> yeah. Public schools all need a mama bear, that's for sure, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Christy also wants to know how much control will you have on textbook choices and does, does Nebraska use the textbooks from Texas? Oh, that's a great question. So Nebraska is a local control state. So what that means is that Nebraska, uh, the State Board of Education will create the standards. So the benchmarks that the students and teachers have to meet. And then it's up to, we pass those standards down. Those standards are created by groups of teachers, groups of professionals, um, and then members of the state board. And then those standards are passed down to local school districts and local school districts get to decide how they meet those standards, how they meet and exceed those standards. So they choose their own curriculum. State Board of Education will make recommendations for curriculum. Um, they'll say like, this is a curriculum we recommend, you know, these are some, some curricular choices that you could consider, but ultimately it's up to the local school districts um, to make those decisions. And I'm a firm believer in local control, right? Because for example, I taught in Western Nebraska uh, in, a, in a teeny tiny consolidated uh, class D school. Um, they are the best position to make their choices rather than like a Lincoln public schools. Like they can't do the same thing that Lincoln public schools is doing in their school. And it's, they, it doesn't even make sense to do necessarily the same thing because it's a different population, different clientele, different needs. So we still meet the same standards. We still go for the same benchmarks, but schools get to decide um, how they meet those benchmarks. Now, I know that when I was teaching in the classroom up until like 2014, 15, um, we did have some textbooks that came from Texas, um, that it was, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that was scrutinized, you know, uh, when they redid the social studies standards and things like that. Um, and I think they've since done a better job of trying to include more honest, inclusive history, um, you know, into our schools, but it's definitely still um, a battle. So my question is kind of a leapfrog off of that. You know, there have been um, school boards that are banning books like nationwide, like crazy. Have you ran, a, has that happened, reared its head yet in any school districts in Nebraska, especially in your district? Yeah, that is a hot button topic all the time. So we have, um, we actually have people showing up to the state board of education meetings, um, you know, asking the state board to ban books outright. Here's the thing, again, because we're a local control state, local schools make those decisions and every school has their own policy. They have like a challenge policy. They have um, uh, like a set of procedures for checking books and having books and what books are in the, in the library or what books are in the curriculum. And so we've seen a lot of people just pr like procedural jumping, right? And like avoiding having any conversations with their local school boards and going straight to the state State Board of Education. Um, our local, like where I'm at in District 6, we've seen some schools that have definitely been hammered um, for certain books that they have in the libraries. Um, what I'm proud to say is that our schools have come out with such firm statements saying, you know what, public schools are for all students. And so that means that one book might not speak to one child, but it certainly will to, to another child. And the largest school districts that have made these public statements, they've all said, we trust our, our media specialists, we trust our, li our librarians, we trust the process. Um, and if you don't want your child reading a certain book, you have that freedom to be able to say as a parent, no, I don't, I don't want my child reading that book. Um, so I've been really pleased um, because I feel like we haven't had a lot of schools that are capitulating to this narrative. Um, and because they understand, right, that there are already processes and procedures in place for choosing quality materials that would speak to, to a diverse group of students. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, Wes wants to know, how can the Nebraska State Board of Education create belonging with its, within its policymaking procedures? Oh, uh, yeah. Just making. Yeah. yeah, this is such a great question. And it's something that I'm really passionate about. Um, you know, and as I've been traveling through District 6, uh, the one community that has struck me the most as feeling so disenfranchised and not included in the policymaking process is the tribal communities, um, our indigenous communities in our state. Um, they feel like they're completely left out of the process. They would love to see more of them more of their history, right, included in our, our history. They would love to have a part in the discussions about some of our schools that still have Indians as mascots, right? Like they want to have, they want to be at the table and they haven't always been invited. 
Um, and so one of the things that I would love to see, and again, you know, I, I, it's a learning process in terms of like how the state board works, but there's no reason why we can't have committees of folks that make up different backgrounds of life. We should have queer folks on the committee. We should have Latino folks on the committee. We should have East African folks on our committee. Uh, we should have native leaders on our committees to, to help make sure that our education is as inclusive as possible. Um, because we don't just teach white children. Um, we have a variety of kids um, that we need to teach and we need our community leaders to be at the table um, to help with that. I also think, you know, like I mentioned earlier, we need to have educator voice on the State Board of Education. Um, and so one of the things that, you know, I've been thinking about a lot is like toying with the idea of why not have a teacher of the year um, be able to serve as a state board member for a year. Other states do that or have an application process whereby people are interested in, in applying to be a state board member for a year term. And then we choose, like we rotate one year, it's a representative from district eight, one year it's a representative from district seven, and we just keep going, right? So that we get representatives from all around the state because I think that's really important too. Um, right now, uh, you know, the other thing that, that I've talked with a lot of voters about is making sure that we have parent and community members who are involved in committees for the State Board of Education. Because, and I think that would have solved so many issues right now because the community that is the loudest right now, they are loud because they feel like they're having the wool pulled over their eyes, right? They feel like the State Board isn't being transparent with them. And I don't think the state board meant to be like non-transparent at all. I don't think they meant to hide anything. It's just that they hadn't had a lot of attention, you know, and people hadn't really come to them. And then all of a sudden, you know, this health standards came and they were completely caught off guard. And so I think having that transparency, allowing community members and parents to serve on committees is super helpful. I also think that our elected officials need to be more available and accessible. Um, you know, one of the things that I noticed is that people in the last two years have come to public comments for their board meetings, whether it's your city council, their school board, um, or like hearings in the legislature. And they'll use their three to five minutes to like yell and scream and maybe even ask questions. And then they wanna engage with their representative. But during public comment is not a time where your representative can engage with you as a constituent. And then people get mad because their, their, their elected official is not engaging with them. So if I'm elected, um, I wanna have quarterly town halls. I wanna have quarterly town halls on Zoom where people can come and we can have those conversations. Um, after every state board meeting, the next week, I wanna have an open Zoom where people can jump on and I can talk for an hour um, about, or I can talk for like 10 minutes, but I can talk for 10 minutes about what the, the work of the state board, what we did in the last meeting, and then give people an opportunity to ask questions and to weigh in, right? These are not really difficult things, but they are ways that um, I think we can create some, some better sense of transparency, some better sense of belonging, some better sense of inclusivity. Yeah, Thank thanks, Wes, for dropping. Thanks for dropping these um, articles in. This is uh, the Wes dropped some articles in the chat from the Grand Island Independent, uh, where that where I live, Grand Island Public Schools. Our superintendent came out with a really strong statement um, supporting books, diverse books, and then Carney Public Schools also came out with a very strong statement. So those are in the chat. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Wes. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> what? Christy is kind of springboarding off of your previous statement. With your population of indigenous, what's your reaction to President Biden's recent acknowledgement of MMIW? You know, we ha I can't remember um, what, the, what the statistic is, but Nebraska has a surprising, uh, uh, like an alarmingly high number of missing murdered indigenous women. Um, and, and so this is incredibly important um, to people in our community. Uh, even, I keep, I keep thinking too about like the graves that have been uncovered, you know, at some of these boarding schools. Um, there were boarding schools in District 6 um, that very likely have graves on the sites um, of these boarding schools. And so this is something again, that we have to take the lead of our native leaders. We have to take the lead of our tribal leaders, but that means that they have to be included 
in the policy making process. Um, and they've just been left out for, I don't think intentionally, um, but I think we have to consider the impact over the intent, right? And the impact of, of not allowing tribal leaders um, to be at the, at the table when we're talking about education for our kids um, is a detriment. Uh, and it's, it's not gonna be able, it's not gonna allow us to be able to serve kids. It's not gonna be able to um, allow us to keep our indigenous women safe and protected, right? Because our, I mean, we've got indigenous girls, you know, that come to our schools and that end up, you know, as MMIW. So it's one of those things that we have to just find ways um, to include tribal leaders. And, you know, the other part of this is we have to build trust um, because it's not gonna happen right away. I've noticed this, you know, as I've talked with tribal leaders um, over the last few months, it's been really difficult to build that trust. And I understand why, you know, um, it's gonna take time uh, to be able to build that trust and restore those fractured relationships that we've had. And I think an important part is what you were talking about earlier was that you're showing up. Yeah. And showing up and you're going to keep showing up yes, and, yes. and you know, you're not just showing up to get their vote. You're showing up because absolutely. you care about their community. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We tabled at the Winnebago powwow. Um, they, they have had a powwow for the last 156 years um, on their reservation lands. I mean, that what an incredible rich history, right? right. Um, and we, we showed up and tabled. We were the only political candidate, you know, that was there. Um, and, and we weren't there I and mean, we were there to like give out candy and like gifts for, you know, we had like games and prizes for kids and things like that. And to, to talk to people about voting, you know, like, yeah. and why their vote matters. So yeah, it's important. Well, thanks for doing that. Yeah. It's important. Um, Wes wants to know what can the Nebraska state BOE do in regards to the GINW student newspaper cut? Yeah, so if any of you are not familiar, Grinnell Northwest is, is a rural public school in where I live, Grand Island. So it's not Grand Island Public Schools. Many people have said, well, Grand Island Public Schools has cut their newspaper. No, Grand Island Public Schools did not. <laughs> um, Grand Island Northwest did. So it's a rural school district. Um, and in June, I believe, after an issue that the editorial staff released, that had a couple of articles that were about pride, like just about the pride, why we celebrate pride month. A um, couple of articles, that's it. The rest of the newspaper was focused on other things within the, um, the school. The school district decided to cut the paper and they didn't give any sort of explanation or response. Previous to that though, there was a trans student who was an editor on, this, on the journalism staff and um, the, the school district made a policy that students had to use the names on their birth certificates and on their bylines. And so this student was dead named in the paper before, before he even knew about the policy. So imagine, right? Like this student who had been known as Marcus by, you know, his teachers and classmates and parents and all of that, um, didn't know about the policy and then read it in the paper, right? That he was dead named. Um, and so that led, that led up to it, right? And then um, students published an issue and then the paper was cut. Um, and in May, I actually helped get that student connected with the ACLU um, because I was like, this is something that the ACLU needs to know about because it certainly seems like a violation of students' free speech. Um, in addition, the journalism program at Grinnell Northwest has been strong for 50 some years and they had just won several awards, um, state level awards for the quality of their reporting. And so for the district to not give any sort of transparency around it was very, very suspicious. Um, so in, in terms of like the state board, what the state board can do is make sure that we have a strong stance, a strong united stance that public schools are for all students, right? Um, there's the free speech thing. Um, that is, you know, a lot of the unicameral, like I think Senator Adam Moorfeld had a bill that came forward to the legislature a couple of years ago that would protect students, student journalist speech, and it, it didn't go anywhere. Um, that's one of the things that the state board can do, though, is help bring that bill back to session um, so that this doesn't happen in other schools. And I think it's, you know, often too about setting setting the tone for transparency. You know, um, I've heard from several people um, 
that while well, Grand Island Northwest didn't cut the paper because of articles about gay kids, they cut the paper because of budgetary reasons. Well, there was no transparency provided. And so it makes it seem like you cut the paper, right? <laughs> because students wrote about something that was important to them that, that the school board didn't like, you know? Um, and so transparency, transparency, transparency. I feel like that's one thing that the state board can do um, to sort of model um, to local school districts. Uh, and I don't know that they've always done that. Um, but then certainly building relationships with state legislatures so we can bring some bills forward that would protect legally student speech. Yeah. And jumping off of that, so gun legislation nationwide is just, you know, with the NRA and special interests just off the charts. Um, and with school, well, we've seen what happened at Uvalde and other places. What kind of um, laws are Republicans trying to pass or are they, or what's going on in Nebraska with that whole Yeah, area? so we had maybe three years ago, um, a state senator in my district, he's not my senator, but he's in district six. Um, he brought forward a bill to arm teachers um, and it was a terrible bill. Um, it's a terrible idea. <laughs> you know, it's something that teachers don't even want. Um, and it's not even statistically proven to, to work or to prevent anything. And so luckily the bill didn't go anywhere. I anticipate it will come up again. Um, I anticipate that our Senator Steve Halloran um, out of Adams County, um, that he will bring this bill up again um, and use Uvalde as a perfect example, you know, as to why we should be arming teachers in classrooms. Um, and so that's one of the things that we're watching. Um, oh, I see Ohio just passed that. Oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that just like makes me sick to my stomach thinking about it. Um, and so I do think that there's a, a real possibility that the bill could get some movement um, in the legislature, especially depending on what happens November 8th which is why we have to show up for gun sense candidates, you know, and we've got some great people running for our state legislature. Um, and we, we need to make sure that, that they're supported. I think Christy has a question. I see her hand raised. <laughs> oh, I just wanted to follow up on that. I just wanted to, have you ever asked um, people who want to arm teachers if they're prepared to have teachers mentally prepared to kill their own students. Mm -hmm. Because statistically, it's their current students or yes. former students who enter those schools. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they're asking teachers to mentally think of the people that they're teaching and supposed to be protecting as potential um, um, gun targets. Yeah, yeah, That's, that is a, an excellent question that I haven't even thought about, you know, it's like it, turning it back. I did have, um, right after Uvalde, I had some really good questions with constituents, you know, who were like, well, what are we gonna do to keep our schools safer, you know? Um, and one, one person mentioned um, arming teachers. And I said, you know, from a teacher, like I was a teacher, um, I don't want guns in, in school. Like that doesn't make me, that wouldn't make me feel safer. It wouldn't make me, feel better for my kids. Um, and, you know, like we have kids that have gun trauma, you know, like my own children have trauma from gun violence. And, uh, and so it's just, it's not an option, but I love the way that you framed that, Christine. I'm going to keep it in my back pocket, um, you know, to be able to have that conversation with, with constituents if it rises again. In Ohio, we're lucky the fact that it, they, it's been left at least up to the school districts and every single school district so far has absolutely rejected it. So really? even so though it's um, out there as a possibility, yeah, it's been rejected. Um, my question is, how is the lack of broadband in rural communities affecting schools in your district? Because I know it's a huge problem nationwide. Yeah, it is a huge problem nationwide. And, you know, it's one of the things that a lot of our rural senators have been working on, um, you know, to get better broadband access. Um, we saw it in Grand Island even um, during the pandemic, uh, right when COVID hit, our school district actually had to go and put in like internet towers um, and hotspots in neighborhoods because we had whole neighborhoods that just didn't even have access. Um, and so it's definitely an issue um, that, 
I think we're getting really close to in our state. Um, we've got we've got lots of good bipartisan support um, for rural broadband and expanding that. So I'm hopeful that we can um, continue to to expand that access. What types of incentives would you like to uh, see to encourage additional teachers, whether it's coming out, you know, or students like studying education as a possible avenue in college or other teachers coming, staying retention or just coming from different states? I know you mentioned making the licensing easier and that type mm -hmm. of thing. Yeah. So I think one of the things that um, we need to be able to do, obviously, is make certification more accessible. I won't say like watered down certification, but we need to make it more accessible for the, the average person. Um, the other thing obviously is funding, right? Like we need to make sure that schools are paying their teachers uh, what they're worth and paying them a living wage. Now that's a local school board issue, um, but you know, and, and just making sure that we get teacher voices out there, um, you know, sharing about the hardships, right? I mean, when we taught in Omaha public schools, um, we knew several teachers that had two, three jobs, you know, in order to support their families uh, while they were teaching. So paying our teachers more uh, is super important. Um, one of the things that I would like to see districts doing more of is paying student teachers. Um, so in Nebraska, um, our, like your very last semester of college when you're working on your teaching degree is you go out and you student teach in a community. Well, that often means that you have to move somewhere, <laughs> you have to live somewhere, and you're working like 7.30 until 4.30 and not getting paid and paying a college 15 hours, <laughs> you know, or 12 hours. Um, so not a lot of people can afford that. I mean, who can, right? Um, and so I think we need to start paying our student teachers um, because a lot of times that will just prevent someone from going into education in the first place. It's like, I can't, I can't pay, right? Like to take 15 hours without getting a paycheck. Um, and, you know, I mean, what other job are you going to work? Like you can wait tables or bartend or things like that, but it's, it's tough work, you know, to teach from 7.30 to 4.30 each day. Um, so paying student teachers, I think is huge. Um, and then I think, you know, we're starting to, to get wind of this with like teacher retention bonuses, you know, and having districts have these teacher retention bonuses. I really think though, when we start treating our teachers like professionals and we start trusting them and we start giving them the autonomy that they deserve, um, when we stop giving our brand new teachers the biggest workloads, um, that's how we retain teachers. Like these solutions are actually really pretty simple and common sense, right? Don't give a brand new teacher nine preps in an eight period day. That's what I had. Um, that's not okay. Like that's how you burn a teacher out, you know? Um, let's not give, you know, a brand new teacher that, you know, the, the, the hardest, the hardest classes, right. Filled with so many layers of trauma and behavioral issues. Like let's not give a new teacher that, right. Let's maybe make a cap on what they can coach or sponsor, right. Maybe you're only going to sponsor or coach one activity. You're not going to do three because in some of our rural schools, our teachers are sponsoring three different activities while they're also teaching, uh, you know, 150 students and four different preps and planning for that. So a lot of this is really, really simple. Trust our teachers, respect our teachers, and don't overwork them. <laughs> and then obviously pay them what they're worth. <laughs> Wes wanted to know if the unicameral would, would need to pass that law as far as paying the student teachers, I think, right? Ah, uh, that's a really good question. I'm not sure if it were like a state, if it were required, probably. You know, I think that individual districts are starting to do that. Like I believe OPS pays some of their student teachers, right? So I think that's where we start first is encouraging districts and finding research that supports that, right? So obviously we'd have to find that research and do all of those sort of studies. Um, but that's that's one of the things that I think that if it was, obviously if it was mandated and required, it may have to go to the unicameral. Fantastic. And my last question is really geared towards the LGBTQ community. Um, what types of things are you seeing? Cause I know Ohio is trying to pass some absolutely awful, awful, awful bills. Um, and luckily they're not making very far mm -hmm. into the legislature, but is, is that happening in Nebraska also? Yeah, we had a bill crop up, um, at the last session and it was 
sort of the anti-CRT, anti-gender sort of bill. Um, it would prevent teachers, it would really be like a silencing tool um, for teachers to not be able to talk about anything related to race, sex, um, gender, anything like that. Um, we had amazing pushback on that bill. I was in the hearing, I went and testified um, against that bill. There were three people in person that testified in support and over 70 in person that testified in opposition and even more that, that wrote in testimonies. And so I don't think we would get anywhere in Nebraska with a bill like that, but what we are seeing locally, right? Um, is a push for our local school districts to abandon things like asking for pronouns. Um, so Gretna Public Schools, a school that I used to teach for, <laughs> they just came out with a policy, you know, and I believe it's where the teachers cannot ask students their pronouns. Um, so it's policies like that, right, that come from the local um, that the state board needs to have a firm and sort of unified belief on um, that we're, we're here, right, to provide a high quality inclusive education for all students. And that may mean that it looks different than education did in 1987. Um, and so we're gonna do simple common sense things like ask students for their pronouns and that's okay. It's not gonna hurt anyone, you know? Um, we're going to like, one of the things that I would love to see is more teacher prep programs um, focusing on things like gender and sexuality. Um, and preparing teachers to actually teach students who have different sexual orientations than their own or different gender identities than their own. Um, again, what I tell people all the time is that like a teacher doesn't necessarily have to change their beliefs in order to create an inclusive environment, right? Um, we like, I'll say it all the time, like when I taught in Ogallala in a teeny tiny Western Nebraska rural school, I was not an affirming teacher then. I was not an affirming person, but you know what? My queer students, they're now in their thirties and they'll say, I felt the safest in your classroom. Like I felt the safest in your classroom. And it wasn't because I was like, oh, everybody who's gay, you know, we can have this sort of like group and things like that. No, it was just because I provided common sense ways for all students to feel included and to feel safe, right? Um, and if a student came out as gay, I was like, oh, cool. Like, what can I do to support you? You know, I mean, that's just the common human thing to do. Um, so it's possible, right? We don't have to get individual people to change their beliefs in order to be able to provide an inclusive and safe environment for all students. That's a great answer. Thank you very much. Um, so the last thing that we usually do before we cut this fantastic interview off is to, if you were stuck in an elevator with me and I was an undecided voter or a, let's say moderate Republican, mm -hmm. um, what could you say to me to convince me to vote for you? Yeah, so I would ask questions. I always, I always ask questions and I would say, um, what are your experiences with education, right? Um, tell me about what your experiences are with public education in our state. And for the most part, Nebraskans, whether they are far left, far right, for the most part, people really have good experiences that they can talk about with their public schools. If I say, tell me about a great experience you had with a teacher, maybe not with your kid's teacher, maybe your own teacher. Most of them can say, oh, I had this really great teacher, right? And like the fourth grade who did all these really cool things for me. You know, and then we talk about, then that leads into a conversation about the importance of public schools, right? That we can't, we can't provide high quality public education without candidates who are supporting public education. And right now we have four candidates running for the State Board of Education who do not believe in the strength of our public schools. Um, and they would like to see education be privatized in Nebraska. Um, and, and, and maybe they, you know, they say that they believe in public schools, they will often say that, but they're, they're, um, their talking points would not point to that, right? Their talking points are not evidence of their support for public education. And so I, that's probably what I would do is, is talk about, you know, a teacher that had an impact on my life in public schools, um, you know, and a teacher, you know, or an experience that um, someone else had, you know, that was a positive experience in public schools. Uh, and then share about like the great work that I see happening in our public schools and our, especially in our rural communities um, where, our public schools and our rural communities are, they're like the heartbeat of our small towns, right? 
um, I was in Wayne where Sherry is from and I was in Wayne this weekend and we went to the homecoming football game. And, you know, they had like the Wayne Public Schools Community Foundation out doing a tailgate and like making food for people. And there were people from all walks of life in the community, right? Um, it was it was packed with folks from the community. That's what you do, you know, on a Friday night in a small town is you go and you support the local school. Um, and so those, those are, that's super important. And without public education, where do we have our community that comes together? I don't know, right? I don't know. So that's probably what I would talk about. Great answer. Great candidate. I have a feeling you have what three or four people on this call that are voting for you or her if they can <laughs> if they're so. in your district. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I want to thank you for taking time to talk to us tonight and educating us about, um, I always learned something. I had no idea, even though I've known West for a while, that Nebraska was a unicameral state. I had no idea. So yeah, 